Hello, welcome, Cabbage here. For New Reincarnation, let's look at Noelle's stories. Previously, I've done analyses of other characters, usually with specific angles, but Noelle is different, so I feel she warrants a unique format which we'll use here. I actually made two previous videos on Noelle, one looking at how she is written, and one looking at the overall near timeline and Noelle's place in it. I'll link to those below. I pushed to get this video done now because we have the Near Reincarnation art book coming next week, and I hope there will be more Noelle related information in there, and I thought it would be fun to compare what we know now with what hopefully will be revealed later. So, why does Noelle deserve a different format of video? Because with her stories, so much importance is on the world around her and the time before and after her time, and Noelle is in some ways just a bystander to the greater story, but in one way a super important character, which I talk about in the Near History video. It's not that important to paint a detailed picture about the world and time that, say, Akiha lived in, for example, but it does matter with Noelle. And to get enough information on Noelle's time and world, we really need to look at all stories related to her, hence this format. I do want to warn folks, however, that compared to my videos on like Gale and Akeha and Argo and Demas and all of them, this one is going to be much less analytical and interpretive. This here is more just me laying stuff out and trying to make sense of it. And it was very worth my time and effort to put together this video. I gained a greater understanding and appreciation for the character of Noelle and her story, and hopefully viewers will get the same watching this. I am separating Noelle's stories into groups about five topics. Uh, one, the original. Two, interactions between the original and her sisters. Three, Noelle's nature. Four, Noelle adopting the original's dream. And five, Noelle realizing the original's dream. First, let's look at the costume story for her three-star guardian version. It reads, number 10, colon one, letter guardian. A square sky, a crucified life. Though she cannot see the flames, she wastes away in bed as the quagmire of disappointment slowly swallows her whole. Her mother's letters and her father's search for a cure are all that keep her going, and yet, even their love now feels like a curse. Eventually, the letters stop. Her father vanishes, and one day, eyes of a different color open in her once familiar face. This costume story is describing a girl sick in bed at a research facility. We learn about her mother and father, the change in her situation, and finally the change in her. It is implied that the illness eventually led to her eyes changing color, presumably orange or red. Next we have the weapon story for the crud lore from the New Year's version of Noelle. It has some bios of people at the research facility. The first two I don't understand their significance, but David Underwood seems to be the father of the girl mentioned in the previous story. I'll read it here. Record of individual David Underwood, a lead engineer on matters of the human body related to the research that was done at this facility, sometimes called chief by researchers from other departments. To continue, we have the record of individual Helena Underwood, redacted. At first, I assumed Helena to be the sick girl's mother, and I thought it was strange that information on her would be redacted since she appears to have no connection to the facility. But then I remembered another name revealed in the main story, Eleanor, and that is the name of the sick girl. So Helena is indeed the mother's name. Then we have a series of three memoirs that are letters from Eleanor to her mother back home. They begin in the year 2003, which is the earliest date we have to associate with Noelle. They show the girl's slow decline, but they also show her love for her home, particularly her garden and the shack by it. Next we can look at R.D. Noelle's Spear, so we are jumping quite ahead in terms of the game's life cycle. It reads, When I was small, I loved the flowers planted beside our hut. I'd smile at them, and mom and dad would be charmed by how much energy I had despite my frailty, but then I had to leave home for treatment. There were no flowers in the research facility, but mom wrote letters and dad was always by my side. Eventually, mom stopped writing and dad got more haggard. I lost my life, became a new me, time dragged on. So we get another reference to the garden and the flowers here. Then we get more beyond the transformation of the girl. She becomes a new version of herself, but in the process loses her body, her parents and her memories. I'll continue with uh, reading the story. I lost my memory, my parents, and a normal life. 
In exchange, I got the hardy body of a weapon and many younger sisters who saved me from loneliness. But the day I got my memory back, it all shattered. It's interesting to note that it says that her memories returned, and that seemed to be the trigger for sending her over the edge. But how did the memories return? And then in the last part, we hear of her at peace. How did she achieve this peace? We'll come back to all of this later, and then I'll read this、uh, final part of the story. Yet my sisters are why I stand here now. Flowers bloom wildly around me, the same ones I saw and heard of in letters. Whenever I see that hut made of white crystal, a smile comes to me and I say, Thank you, I'm home. So that is the end of the first grouping, which was stories about the original, Eleanor. Next, let's turn to grouping two, the interactions between the original and her sisters, all of this taking place before the original regains her lost memories. And then this is where the writer's only live stream revealed story comes in. I will translate it here.、Uh, at that time, I received my name. I was happy for it. And I thought I wanted to give names to my sisters as well. The sisters' names came from a mixture of my name and some other meaning. And I thought that, that having that commonality. Would、uh, make us feel more like a family. As my little sisters、uh, grew in numbers, I would give them more and more names one by one. And because I was the one that gave them their names, I remembered all of them. But there was one name that I never gave anyone. It was the name that was originally given to me. A name that fills me with joy and sadness, a name that I do not know. This is the original talking about naming her sisters. It's quite clear that she has a lot of affection for them, who are essentially her clones. They are all identical in looks. And then the last part where she refers to the name that she does not give, I assume that that was her own. She never gave Eleanor to another of her sisters. And then, interestingly, when the writer introduced this story, she called it the zeroth story. That was the exact word that she used, zero. And I saw the chat immediately jump to making the connection to Dragon Dragoon 3 Zero. And thinking about it, there are similarities there red eyes, sisters, connections to dragons. I'll leave it to the Dragon Dragoon fans to go further with that, but maybe the writers were hinting at something. Maybe we'll get something more in the art book coming up. And this next slide is interesting. It is a fan made list of names that contain the EL element that, in like Arabic or Hebrew, means of the god. The names named in various stories are in red, those are confirmed names, while all the others are unknown and just chosen by the fan that put this together. I wish I could tell you where I got this, but I completely forgot. <laughs> this was months ago. I'm pretty sure I got it off Twitter. But after I checked the account that I was most sure it was from, it was not there, so I don't know, I'm sorry. If this is yours, then let me know. I do have issues with the numbering, however. Helena, the mother, really should not have a number, not even zero. She should not be on this list. Zero belongs to Eleanor because she is the progenitor, the original. And then Noel is the final one at 123. There is one other confirmed name, Eliza. And I think she is a different number also to what is shown here. We'll come back to that in a bit. But the chart is at the very least useful because seeing it like this gives us an idea of the great number of clones made, and also the great variety of names with EL in them. Next, let's look at Noelle's fragment, which is gained after finishing her section in the People World arc. And all of these fragments sum up each character pretty succinctly. It reads as following The Path Unknown. I could never figure it out. Why did our elder sister care for us like she did? She gave us names. She always tried to be kind to us. She always tried to protect us. I wanted to know why. I wanted to feel closer to her, even if just a little bit. That's why I felt so bothered by coming to the cage. I was sure I had somewhere else I needed to be. But I don't quite look at it that way anymore. I'm sure my elder sister would describe this as a necessary detour. A detour I must make if I am to arrive at the place I cherish, and for her sake I will continue pressing forward. This reiterates the original's care for her sisters and hints at Noelle's adopted dream. 
But I would argue that probably Noelle is maybe the only one that feels this way about her older sister. We will see in other stories that um, all of the other younger sisters are not as developed, you know, emotionally, don't have as much insight or uh, knowledge. And so this is a sign, I think, of uh, Noelle kind of standing out from all of her other sisters. Then here is a three-star spear, the SIF-06 append, and then SIF stands for Sisters Fangs, as the writer said in a live stream. These would be like, you know, weapons for the sisters. And then SIF weapons of all sorts seem to exist. We hear of swords and rifles, but for the most part, we only see spears in reincarnation. The information from this spear is very interesting for multiple reasons. In the first section, we are introduced all over again to the idea that weapons carry the memories of their users and that weapons are passed down among the clone sisters. It reads, This spear belonged to the first elder sister whose memories I inherited. I take care of it, but it's obviously way more banged up than it used to be. I propose that this number six weapon originally belonged to clone number six, and then I'll explain why I think that later. And the second part teaches us that there are different weapon types and that the original used a sword. It reads, My original elder sister had a sword akin to the spear. They made many weapons for us, weapons for weapons as it were, and this spear is one of the first. The fact that the original, uh, number zero, used a sword is confirmed later when we meet the original and then get her sword. And then the last two parts of the story are the weapon and memory inheritor working on repairing the spear and enjoying the work. This for me points directly to the Twitter series of character profiles where it is revealed that Noel's talent is repairing weapons, and so I conclude that this weapon story is Noel's direct thoughts and feelings, meaning Noel got the spear directly or indirectly from specimen number six. Next, let's look at the vanilla SIF-06, which came with abstract Noel's version. The owner of this was Eliza, the likely first user of SIF-6, and the sixth clone. So we get confirmation of a name from Eleanor, and we also understand that only the original uses those names. The researchers refer to the clones only by their numbers, calling them Specimen 1, Specimen 2. Reading the weapon story, only one person calls me Eliza, and she is our original. She is the one we are to protect in the event of an emergency. She always offers to get whatever we want, even though we are weapons who desire nothing. Yet, she still pays us more mind than she needs to. She tells us to count on her. Her insistences are unreasonable. We are disposable and unlikely to disappear so long as she lives. And so here, we get more evidence that the original cares for her sisters and that the original loses her mind later on. We begin to get a great idea that the original has a real need for companionship or even family, and it is played out in her actions towards her sisters who, lacking much of what the original has, do not reciprocate. The story continues, We cannot understand our original's actions, but on the day her screams shake the facility, I finally understand why she cares so much for us. Next, let's look at Bloody Noel Spear, which involves a direct conversation between the original and a sister. It reads, Is there a dream you want to come true? I do not understand the original's question. I do not even understand what a dream is. And so here, we understand the clones do not dream, but what's really interesting is that if she is asking about it, it seems the original does still dream, or at least knows what they are. So the original, although she lost her body and memories, still retains parts of her that the clones did not receive. Then we see the narrator ask a researcher and we learn why the clones do not dream, and the narrator goes back to the original, and the original gives a sad smile, maybe out of pity, and it becomes pretty clear that the original kept most or all of her humanity, even if it lost all of her memories. To conclude the story, I query the meaning of dream to a researcher. Dreams, she replies. Dreams are primarily sight-based mental images that humans experience during periods of sleep. She then explained how they relate to the consolidation of a person's memories and about the meanings people ascribe to them. But since the rest of you don't sleep, you won't ever have a chance to dream. After our talk, I informed the original that because we do not sleep, therefore we do not dream. The original just smiles sadly. 
I do not understand what her smile means. And I suppose now is a good time to get into what sets off the original. It is her being told the truth about her identity, how she used to be just a girl with a family and a home, and the realization of this and the anger that came with it broke the original, and the dragon within her manifested and destroyed the facility and all the sisters except Noelle, who was in cryostasis. And then this is interesting. Earlier, I talked about most of the Sif weapons we got were spears, but here is the one exception, Sif 16, a staff. This is narrated by a researcher saying certain clone numbers going abnormal, the first being number six, which I propose is Eliza. And then it is revealed 16 here also went haywire. There is no explanation or even idea of a cause, but the researcher voices doubt about the cryostasis which Noel underwent and woke independently from. I do have a theory for why they acted abnormally, but that too we'll get to later. And then to read the story. It was the first case since Specimen 6, but production had been so smooth and manufacturing conditions were optimal. What on earth could have caused it? Specimens 14, 15, and 17 all woke without a hitch? Sure, we'd had had accidents before, but this and number 6 were different. Is it coincidence? If so, that's even worse. It's still unclear what causes the symptoms. Specimen 6's abnormality? How it recovered consciousness afterwards? We still have absolutely no idea. The only thing they have in common is their production number. I tell you, I'm starting to question deploying bioweapons kept in cold storage. Alright, and then before we move on to the grouping addressing Noelle's nature, Let's look at Noelle before we meet her in the main story, and before really her true awakening, as it says here. Reading the story. This is the story of before she awoke. An eddying spiral. Repeated death. So many lives were made, awakened, and vanished. So many hopes crumbled without taking form. Only one girl was freed from this cruel struggle. She alone carries hope's burden, crossing the earth to fulfill her vow of finding the place the first girl dreamed of. And so from this story, we get a hint that Noelle has some unnamed yearning, and there is also another hint at the adoption of the original's dream. And here, I wanted to point out kind of a cultural take the Japanese have on the idea of dreams that is different than versus, say, Americans. Just like in English, dreams can mean both the dreams that we see when we are asleep and things that we would like to experience or accomplish in waking life. But regarding the waking sort, Something I hear a lot of in Japan is, I have no dreams of my own, or I was so inspired by this other person having a dream, stuff like that. It's like it's not even the content of any one dream, it's simply having any dream at all. I feel like having dreams is a very natural thing among Americans. It's like life goals or bucket lists or the American dream. But in Japan, dreams are not a given, not assumed not encouraged even, and only the special or privileged or lucky can have them. Society is pretty rigid in Japan, and there is not a lot of leeway for people to conceive of dreams, much less pursue them. And so I feel like part of what Noelle's story is saying is, Noelle is someone without dreams of her own, someone who can barely even conceive of the notion, and is therefore a representative for so many Japanese people, perhaps especially young people. But Noelle's arc demonstrates a path First, by her being inspired by her sister's dream, and then picking it up, and seeking to realize it before ultimately adapting that into her own dream. I think part of what the writers are saying through the character of Noelle is, you can have dreams, and you can make them happen. Alright, and then to cap the pre-awakening Noelle study, uh, we can look at a couple weapons. Her dark memory weapon cements the warlike setting and iterates the similarities of weapons used by the clones. It reads as following, The scars of war mar the desolate city. As plants reach out from the cracks in the asphalt, a girl clad in a black coat quietly stares at the sight. Nature's growth covers the city's wounds. The girl steps off her motorbike and approaches the plants, for she spotted a glint under the shade of leaves. The object is a damaged sniper rifle, as she gazes at the bent barrel, she realizes her own spear resembles the gun to an uncanny degree. She might be imagining the similarities, yet she can't throw the gun away. 
So she stuffs it into the bag on the back of her motorbike and rides off. And then we have the fractured weapon, which iterates the shallow pool of knowledge of clones designed for battle and nothing else. The story reads, I grip the spear tightly so I can be sure it is real. I am tired and injured from the long battle. My fingertips are numb. Are all my fingers still there? I don't know. I don't have time to check. My vision goes red. Is this my blood or does it belong to someone else? So here let's turn to the third grouping where we meet Noelle and we can point out the differences between her and the rest of the sisters. First is a note that we get in the main story. Sorry I don't have the English, but it basically reads, We here don't have a lot of time left on this earth, but I finally found a way for my daughter to live for herself. Please help her, D.U. D.U. must stand for David Underwood, and I assume he's talking about the inhabitants of the research facility getting killed off by, I don't know what, white chlorination syndrome, legion. This would be about the time period when that was happening, if it were on the same timeline. Eleanor is saved in cryostasis, and this note is addressed to whomever may find the facility, and it is indeed found by a new group of researchers who take Eleanor and begin making clones of her, and that's how we get the original and then 1 through 123. So getting into grouping 3, Noelle's nature, here first we have her three-star dissenting costume, and it demonstrates her lack of knowledge of anything. Again, she was designed for battle and was not given information on anything else, so a diary and its use would be totally foreign. But here we do get a bombshell. Noelle sees dreams in her sleep. So we already have a great difference between her and her sisters, who do not sleep and therefore do not dream. And then we have various costumes and weapons, basically repeating this notion of zero knowledge and understanding, the abstract costume, the summer costume and weapon, the circus weapon, the Christmas weapon, all saying Noel does not understand a concept or characteristic about humanity. The Christmas costume also repeats this, but brings up an idea we touched on earlier. Noel says, maybe I would understand if I had a family. I feel like this links to the original's desire for a family as demonstrated by treating her sisters like her family, even though she presumably lost her memories of her actual family. And that was brief, but uh, that's it for Noelle's nature. Next, we will move to Noelle adopting the original's dream, but we'll keep an eye out for more differences between her and her other sisters. We can look at her two-star costume and weapon first. They both hint at a voice within Noelle and Noelle's desire to follow the voice. Reading the costume story, one of a countless number of girls who was created by a research facility to be a living weapon, her eyes glow a ghastly red during battle, revealing her true nature. She now follows the voice in her head as she moves through the world, cutting down strange white specters. And the weapon reads, I wield my spear with eyes glowing red. I wield my spear to seek the place commanded of me by the voice. I wield my spear as I feel pain nestle deep in the recesses of my heart. I wield my spear because I have finally found the path I must walk. Then, let's look at the fifth secret story, which is the same for every character, Mama's analysis of the character. Mama lays out the history of the original and then goes into Noelle picking up the dream. And then, Mama does some foreshadowing about what will happen if and when Noelle completes the journey. And then, we have a number of costumes and weapons that reiterate Noelle's desire to follow the voice within her, the voice of the original. We have the anniversary costume and weapon, the New Year's costume, the fractured costume, the circus costume, and even the bloodless costume, which looks like a jumble, but in the parts we can understand, they do reinforce our understanding of her. And then we have a few oddball stories. I don't know where to place, so we'll put them here. The bloody costume mentions time and the little of it remaining. That may refer to the voice within Noel becoming stronger and stronger. The abyssal costume seems to be about the change within the original, while the Abyssal Weapon is about, I don't know what, and interpretations there are welcome. The Final Fantasy costume is about battle. The Sino Alice costume and weapon are, understandably, more about Red Riding Hood than Noelle. And the Yorha stage play costume mirrors beings created for battle but who desire more, specifically companionship and freedom. <laughs> 